Good afternoon, everyone, and Michael, thank you for that introduction. I think with The Economist two hands, you captured the two sides of Paul Krugman, so well done. And uh, I do enjoy my job tremendously. I don't know whether I'm happy, but I, but I do enjoy what I do a, a great deal. It's great to be back in Brisbane, so I'm happy for that, uh, for that uh, privilege. And I'm also happy to have the privilege to talk to the Economic Society here in Brisbane again. It's great to be back after two years. Today, I'd like to begin by providing you with an update on the outlook for the Australian and global economies. And then I want to discuss how our thinking on the appropriate stance of monetary policy has evolved over time. So I'll start off with the global picture. Up until the middle of last year, the global economy was growing quite briskly, as you can see in this first chart. Then over the second half of last year, growth slowed, and the slower pace of growth has continued into this year. There are a few factors that help explain this slowing. The first is a slowdown in the Chinese economy. The Chinese economy, the Chinese authorities for some time have been seeking to address the build-up of risks in the financial system. As part of their efforts on this front, they've sought to rein in shadow banking, and the effect of this has been felt right across their economy. And because of the size of the Chinese economy, the impact has also been felt around the world. A second factor is a marked slowdown in international trade, which you can see here. Over the past year, global trade has not grown at all. This is unusual, as historically, international trade increases a bit faster than GDP. The recent weakness in international trade reflects the slowdown in the Chinese economy, but it also reflects the increase in tariffs by both the US and China. Not surprisingly, slower growth in international trade has flowed through into weakened conditions in the manufacturing sectors around the world, and there's been significant disruptions to some supply chains. Business investment too has been affected with firms delaying investment decisions. In the face of the increased uncertainty brought about by the trade disputes, many businesses have simply preferred to wait and to see what happens before they decide to invest. There's also been a cyclical downturn in the global electronics industry, which has weighed on investment and, in, and exports, particularly in some of our East Asian economies. And the third contributing factor to the slowdown in global growth has been a series of country-specific factors, including a natural disaster in Japan, new vehicle emissions testing regime in Germany, and some extra, some, some additional um, extreme weather events. So these are the, some of the factors that have been at work. Looking forward though, the picture does look to be a little brighter. And it is reasonable to expect that growth will strengthen a little later in the year. And there are a number of reasons for this. First of all, the Chinese authorities have responded to the slowing in their economy with some extra measures to support economic activity. Globally, financial conditions are also very accommodative, and major central banks have single, singled an easier monetary policy stance than they um, had earlier signalled. It's also reasonable to expect that the drag on growth from some of the country-specific factors that I mentioned will pass in time. Consumption growth in many economies also remains robust, supported by strong employment growth and by rising wages. And notably, the weakness in the manufacturing sector has not spilled over in any material way to the service sectors in the advanced economies. So all this means that the global economy appears quite resilient at the moment. The big uncertainty, though, remains trade policy. A resolution of the current disputes would help boost trade flows and reduce some of the uncertainties facing businesses around the world. In that case, we could pick up, we could expect a pick up in investment, and that would be a positive for the global economy. On the other hand, a failure to resolve the disputes represents a major downside risk to the global economy. So there's a lot riding on this issue. One other feature of the global economy that I'd like to draw your attention to is the coexistence of low unemployment and low inflation, as you can see in this chart. Unemployment rates in many of the major economies are the lowest that they've been in decades. In some countries, unemployment rates are back to where they were in the early 1970s. At the same time, too, inflation remains low. Inflation rates are mostly below 2%, and mostly they're below the central bank targets. 
This experience is the very opposite to that of the 1970s and the early 1980s. During that period, many countries experienced what became known as stagflation, the coexistence of high unemployment and high inflation. Today, the picture is very different. We have low unemployment and low inflation. And this is obviously a much better configuration. Understanding why this has happened is a priority for us at the Reserve Bank, as we too here in Australia are experiencing something similar. We're still searching for the full answers, but the fact that the experience is common across so many countries suggests there are some global factors at work. In my view, these are partly linked to changes in technology and to globalisation. Both of these factors affect perceptions of competition and they're both a source of uncertainty about the future and in turn they're both affecting pricing decisions right around the world. We can't be sure how long these effects will last and whether the coexistence of low inflation and low unemployment is temporary or whether it's the new normal. Whether or not it is permanent, the coexistence of low inflation and low unemployment does appear to be highly persistent. And this persistence has led to a reassessment in a number of countries of the unemployment rate that is sustainable without inflation becoming a concern. This is an important issue and one that I want to return to in the context of Australian monetary policy. Before I do that though, I'd like to provide an update on the Australian economy. Just as the global economy slowed over the second half of 2018, so did our economy. As you can see here, we went from growing at an above average pace in the first half of last year to a below average pace over the second half. As has been the case globally, we had our own country specific factors that have temporarily weighed on growth, including the drought and some disruptions to resource exports and production. More fundamentally though, the main reason for the shift in momentum in our economy is a slowdown in household consumption growth. Over the second half of 2018, household consumption increased by just three quarters of 1%, and that's an unusually soft outcome. The decline in housing prices is certainly a factor here, but the more important factor is the long period of weak growth in household income. As you can see in this next chart, over the past three years, household disposable income has increased at an average rate of just two and three quarter percent. This compares to an average increase of 6% over the preceding decade. And that's a very big change from 6% to less than 3%. As this period of weak income growth has persisted, it's become harder for households to dismiss it as just something that's temporary, as something that will pass quickly that they can look through. The lower rate of income growth has also made it harder for households to pay down their debts. And the end result has been that many people have had to change their spending plans and they've had to tighten their belts and that's evident in the uh, consumption figures. And we saw further evidence of this a few weeks ago in the retail trade data for the March quarter. We're not expecting a quick turnaround in growth in household consumption, but we are expecting a gradual improvement. This is largely on the basis of an expected pickup in growth in household income and a stabilisation of the housing market over the period ahead. As you can see in this chart, we're expecting household disposable income to grow at an average rate of 4% over the next couple of years, which is noticeably higher than the average of recent times. Stronger growth in income will help, but the more important factor here is some tax relief. Over the past year, tax paid by households increased at a much faster rate than did household income almost 10% compared to three, three and a quarter percent. That's a very big difference and it's highly unusual. And we're not expecting it to continue for a couple of reasons. First, the tax offsets for low and middle income earners announced in the recent budget will boost disposable income. And second, it's likely that we'll return to a more normal relationship between growth in income and growth in taxes paid. And our expectation is that the stronger growth in household disposable income will throw th flow through into household spending, but it's going to take some time for this to happen.
Looking beyond, beyond household spending, the outlook for the Australian economy is being supported by a number of other factors. The first is the ongoing investment in infrastructure. This investment is important. It's not only supporting demand in the economy at a time when it's needed, but it's also adding to the supply capacity of the Australian economy, and it's also directly improving people's lives, including through re reducing um, transport congestion. Another supporting factor is the strong growth in demand for services, partly as a result of ongoing population growth. Another positive is the recent lift in the terms of trade, which have continued to surprise on the upside, boosting our national income. The outlook for investment in the resource sector has also improved due to both higher levels of sustaining capital investment and the commencement of some new projects. As you can see here, after five years of declining mining investment, we are expecting an increase in mining investment over the next couple of years. Non-mining business investment is also on an upward trend as firms invest in additional capacity. By contrast, investment in residential construction is likely to be a drag on the economy for the next few years. After six years of strong growth, residential construction is now declining, and as you can see, this is likely to continue for a while yet. In comparison to the GDP data, the labour market data over the past year have painted a stronger picture of the economy, and they've mostly surprised on the upside. More people have joined the labour market, and job creation has been very strong, with employment increasing by around 2.5% over the past year, compared with growth in the working age population of 1 and 3 quarter percent. The unemployment rate has also come down over the past year. Recently, though, some labour market indicators have softened a little. The unemployment rate ticked up to 5.2% in April. The underemployment rate has also moved a little higher as there are more part-time workers seeking additional hours. Job advertisements have also declined a bit and hiring intentions have come off their earlier highs. So there's been a softening of some of the indicators. At the same time, though, it's important to remember that the vacancy rate remains very high, monthly employment growth remains firm, and hiring intentions by businesses remain above average. Putting these various indicators together, the labour market does appear to be quite resilient. While our expectation is that employment growth will slow over the period ahead to be broadly in line with growth in the working age population. The other element of the labour market that I'd like to comment on is wages. As the labour market has strengthened over the past year, wages growth in the private sector has picked up, as you can see in the left-hand side here. By contrast, wages growth in the public sector has been steady at around 2.5%. Overall, though, wage growth remains lower than the rate that would appear consistent with inflation being comfortably within inside the target range. And even in New South Wales and Victoria, where the unemployment rates have averaged around 4.5% over recent times, wage growth has been running at just 2.5%. It would appear to me that some of the global factors that I mentioned that are holding down uh, globally uh, inflation are also working here in Australia as well. Putting these various elements together, our central scenario as outlined in the recent statement on monetary policy is for the Australian economy to grow by around two and three quarter percent this year and next. As always though, there's a range of uncertainty around these forecasts and you can see that range of uncertainty is quite wide. Even so, the central outlook is for growth at around our current estimate of potential in the Australian economy. And given this, over the next two years, we ex expect the unemployment rate to move broadly sideways and be around 5%. In 2021, the central forecast is for slightly better outcomes, partly due to the pickup in the resources sector that I spoke about. It's worth pointing out that when preparing these forecasts, we used our normal technical assumption that interest rates would move broadly in line with market pricing. At the time the forecasts were prepared, market pricing implied that the cash rate was expected to decline to 1% by the end of the year. If instead we had used an assumption of unchanged interest rates, the growth forecast would have been lower and the forecast for unemployment would have been higher. <coughs> 
I'd now like to turn to inflation and the outcome for the March quarter was noticeably lower than we had expected. In year-ended terms, headline inflation was 1.3% and in underlying terms it was around 1.5%. Looking through the details though, there appear to be only limited inflation pressures across much of the economy. The low rates of wage growth are contributing to relatively low rates of inflation in the services sector. Rent inflation is also the lowest it's been in many decades and various government initiatives to ease cost of living pressures for households are contributing to lower increases for many administered prices. Together, these factors have meant that the rate of inflation for non-traded goods and services is as low as it's been in a long time, as you can see in the top panel. The picture for traded goods and services is a little different, though. Recently, there has been an increase in some food prices as a result of the drought and the floods. The earlier small depreciation of the exchange rates also been passed through into the prices of some consumer durables. These developments mean that tradable prices of group are no longer declining, but even so, inflation for this group remains low and inflation across the economy remains subdued. Looking forward, the central forecast is for underlying inflation of around one and three quarter percent this year, 2% next year and a little higher beyond that. In headline terms, inflation is expected to be noticeably higher in the June quarter due to the recent increase in petrol prices. For 2019 as a whole, headline CPI inflation is expected to be around 2% and the same the following year. This means that inflation is expected to remain around the bottom of our medium term target range over our forecast horizon. I would now like to turn to monetary policy and how our thinking and communication has evolved over recent times. You might recall that through 2018, we had three main messages. The first was that we're making progress towards our goals of inflation and unemployment. The second was given that this progress was expected to continue, it was more likely that the next move in interest rates would be up rather than down. And the third message was Given this progress towards our goals was expected to be only gradual, any movement in interest rates seemed some way off. Earlier this year, our assessment of the balance of probabilities around the likely direction of the next move in interest rates shifted a little. At the Reserve Bank Board meeting in February, we assessed that the probabilities of an interest rate increase and a decrease had become more evenly balanced than they were through 2018. This shift reflected two developments. The first was the slowing in the Australian economy over the second half of 2018 that I spoke about, and the second was the lower than expected inflation outcome for the December quarter. The main counterfailing consideration was the labour market, which as I said before, painted a stronger picture of the economy than the other indicators. In the face of these conflicting signals, we judged that the best approach was to hold interest rates steady while we maintained a clearer picture of the direction of the economy. It was though relatively clear that if the GDP data were giving the better signal and the labour market eventually softened, that lower interest rates would likely be appropriate. This was especially so in light of the ongoing low rate of inflation. This assessment was reflected in the minutes of the board's April meeting, where we discussed a scenario in which there was a lack of progress on inflation and the unemployment rate trended higher. Following our April meeting, we received another reading on inflation, which confirmed that price pressures were subdued across the economy. Over the past year, and particularly in the past two quarters, Inflation has come in lower than we expected, and as you can see in this chart, our inflation forecasts have been revised down. In contrast to the downside surprises on inflation, employment growth has been stronger than we had expected. You can see that on the right-hand panel. In most cases, when employment growth is stronger than, than expected, we normally see an upside, not a downside surprise on inflation. 
So from this perspective, the recent experience is a little unusual. As the board has sought to understand this experience and studied similar experiences abroad, we've been asking ourselves the following question. What rate of unemployment is achievable in Australia without generating inflation concerns? Over recent years, the answer to this question was thought to be 5%. In other words, it was thought that if the unemployment rate was below 5%, that was likely to put pressure on the supply capacity of the economy and in turn raise inflation. But from today's perspective, I think we can do better than this. My judgment of the accumulating evidence is that the Australian economy can support an unemployment rate of below 5% without raising inflation concerns. And this would be consistent with the experience overseas, with many other advanced economies sustaining lower rates of unemployment than previously thought possible, without leading to a noticeable uplift in inflation. Now, if this judgment is correct, the next question is, how does our society achieve and sustain a lower rate of unemployment than 5%? It's possible that the current policy settings are sufficient to deliver this. After all, the labour market has surprised on the upside over recent times, and it could do so again. While we can't rule out this possibility, the recent flow of data makes it seem less likely, at least in the short term. In the event that the unemployment rate does not move lower with current policy settings, there are a number of options. These would include one, further monetary easing, two, additional fiscal support, including through spending on infrastructure, and three, structural policies that support firms expanding, investing, innovating, and employing people. Now, relying on just one type of policy has its limitations, so each of these policies is worth thinking about. The Reserve Bank Board recognises that monetary policy does have a role to play here. Earlier today, we released the minutes of the Board's meeting, which took place two weeks ago. At that meeting, we discussed a scenario in which there was no further improvement in the labour market and the unemployment rate remained around the 5% mark. In this scenario, we judged that inflation was likely to remain low relative to the target and that a decrease in the cash rate would likely be appropriate. A lower cash rate would help support employment growth and it would bring forward the time when inflation is consistent with the target. Given this assessment, at our meeting in two weeks' time, we will consider the case for lower interest rates. Thank you for listening and I look forward to answering your questions. So my first question is this. You were talking about structural change. And um, Mario Draghi, the, um, uh, the president of the European Central Bank, every time he does a press conference, he talks about the need for uh, structural change um, in, um, uh, in the European economy. Why do central banks think, that, and you've just talked about it now, uh, why do central banks think that structural uh, policy and structural adjustment, microeconomic reform is so important? It's because ultimately um, what delivers improvement in people's living standards is uh, productivity growth and often that can come from structural reform. I mean, monetary policy and fiscal policy in the short term can manage the cycle, but in the end we can't drive stronger growth over the medium term in the Australian economy. What will drive stronger growth are structural policies that promote firms hiring people, investing, uh, being innovative and expanding. And so the policy settings that government set really are important in, in that frame. Things like education policy, the attitude towards entrepreneurship and innovation, 
uh, the way we invest in infrastructure, the design of the tax system. These are the things that ultimately can drive economic growth. And I think Mario Draghi talks about that because he feels, as sometimes we do, the frustration that comes from the expectation that the central bank can be the entity that drives economic growth over the medium term. And the reality is we can't. It's these structural things that drive growth. Do you think uh, this might be time for Ian Harper to have some of his recommendations considered again? He, well, he has a policy on microeconomic reform. Well, in the long list of things that uh, can promote uh, economic growth, I would include competition policy. And Ian has uh, written about that extensively in the past. So one of the things that makes firms seek out new ideas, invest in new technologies and employ people is the fear of competition. And so competition policy can, in fact, be a, a promoter of um, economic growth. So I think it's worth looking at that again. Yep. Now, uh, I'll just ask a question about monetary policy, and I won't ask about interest rates, but I'll talk about uh, in inflation. Uh, Jay Powell, who's the chairman of the Fed, has, uh, uh, at the last, after the last couple of meetings, talked about the Fed having a symmetric target on, on inflation. And what that seems to mean in the Fed, uh, for the Fed is that they're prepared to allow inflation to run above their target of 2% on the PCE deflator for a while, um, to get the actual price level up. Uh, to, and so uh, they'd, they'd almost be running uh, inflation above the target for as long as they, we've been running, or they've been running inflation for below the target. If you ever got so lucky as to inflation took off uh, above the target uh, of your 2 to 3% target, would you let inflation run a little bit like the Fed is thinking of doing? Well, I'm not sure that's the kind of exactly correct characterisation of what the Fed uh, wants to do, but uh, putting that aside, up until the, the uh, recent period where we've had three years of being under 2%, we had as much time above the top of the medium-term target range as we've had below. So our inflation target for the last 25 years has intentionally been flexible. What we want the community to understand is that the average rate of inflation in Australia will be 2 point something. That means sometimes it's probably going to be higher than two point something, and sometimes it'll be a bit below. And we're in an extended period where it's below. Um, that doesn't mean we'd be targeting an extended period where it's above, but over time, my board wants to deliver for you an average rate of inflation that's two point something. And to do that, most of the time, we're kind of shooting towards the middle of the target range. We want to be comfortably with inside the target range. We're not there yet. And this is one of the reasons I was talking uh, today about the need for lower unemployment. Because if we don't have lower unemployment, then I think wage growth is going to stay low, inflation pressures are going to stay low, and inflation will be kind of around two, when really we want it to be comfortably within the two to three percent range, and I don't think we're yet there yet. But I wouldn't be shooting for kind of sure. over three. It seems a long way away to be talking about inflation being above three percent in Australia. Now, uh uh, is there anybody from the floor who wants to ask a question? Please go over towards the... Ah, you can come over there. And I... And, uh, I will, sorry, is that? Right there. OK. The gentleman on, the, on our left. Um, good afternoon. Uh, it's Rory Robertson from Westpac Group Treasury. Um, thank you, Dr Lowe, for your important talk and uh, thank you for taking our questions. Uh, we, we just touched on this topic. Uh, Earlier this month, after the Reserve Bank Board left interest rates unchanged, a, a high-profile and somewhat uh, influential academic econ economist, uh, Professor Richard Holden, uh, wrote an opinion piece in the Australian Financial Review uh, in which he advised readers to mark down May 7 as the day the Reserve Bank of Australia abandoned its 2 to 3% uh, inflation targeting regime that it used for a quarter of a century. I think you've just confirmed that, in fact, that, that, um, that regime is still intact. And given the Reserve Bank is still taking uh, strong strong indications from its inflation targeting framework. I wonder if you'd be, uh, I wonder if you'd think it was fair to say that uh, the Reserve Bank has has uh, not only a, uh, a, an easing bias, but a red hot easing bias. Uh, well, I won't comment on the adjective you use, but I think it's fair enough to say that we have an easing bias and um, so I, I want to reassure that the inflation target remains central to our monetary policy framework. 
We wanted to deliver an average rate of inflation, I said average uh, between 2 and 3 per cent, and I'm confident that we will do that, but we're realistic that we'll take some time to get inflation above 2 per cent. Um, we think we'll get there, but it's just going to take some time. Uh, what is ultimately important is that we deliver for the community low and stable inflation. So that inflation is not something that you all have to worry about when making your decisions about financial investment or investing in capital or employing people. I think we're in that position at the moment. I don't think most of you worry, hopefully, about inflation when making your decisions. Uh, we want to get inflation back to uh, 2 point something percent. We're not that far away either. Remember, by the end of this year, we're expecting inflation to be 2 percent. So that still remains the kind of the guiding um, principle that we use for our monetary policy decisions. But we've never been a central bank that is driven exactly by the inflation forecast to get inflation up quickly. We want to make sure that's our North Star, and it is, and we'll gradually get there, but it is taking time. And I think we just have to accept that. I think we've got a question over there on our left. Sorry? Hi, it's Michael Kennedy. I'm a financial planner, and I guess one of the areas we're seeing at the moment is an increased amount of tax compliance and data-rich information from the ATO, and that's good and bad in some regards. The R&D focuses have seen some of our clients step away from that because the compliance burden is quite large. I was particularly interested in your stat of a 10% increase in tax paid by households whilst incomes are holding fairly flat. <coughs> and just curious about, I guess, how you're seeing the data set and how that's becoming more rich, and I guess what your thoughts are on, I guess, tax per household. Yeah, well, I mean, it's a bit hard to understand why tax paid by households has grown at almost 10% when their kind of gross income is kind of close to four. One hypothesis is the tax office has got better at compliance. The uh, changes to the rules about expenses for investment properties that the government introduced in the budget uh, a year ago, uh, and uh, the electronic matching that people, the tax office now does and the ability of us all to do tax online, it's less likely that we forget about income because of the matching that's going on. So it may be the better compliance is leading us to pay the right amount of tax. And that's happened over the past year, and it's weighed on um, income growth, on net income growth. And we're not expecting that to be repeated again this year. But that's just a hypothesis. I don't really have um, strong evidence to support that, though. If we could have a microphone to it. Sorry. What policies do you feel could be enacted by the government that would help you hit your unemployment and inflation targets? Um, well, I don't want to give the government kind of <laughs> advice, particularly in the, in the early days, but um, I'm saying monetary policy can play a role. I mean, an easing of monetary policy would probably um, lead to a depreciation of the currency, or at least the expectation um, of an easing will lead to a depreciation. And it would also free up the cash flow of some households, those households with debt. And uh, it's reasonable to assume that some of that money would be spent. So I think an easing of monetary policy would uh, help lower unemployment and get us closer to the inflation target. But that's not the only policy option we have as a country to lower unemployment. Uh, I've been a strong advocate of increased spending on infrastructure, not only because it helps with demand management, but it adds to the supply capacity of the economy and actually makes it all our lives better. So um, I, I would be advising all governments, not just the federal government, state governments, to make sure that they're investing in infrastructure that creates jobs and increases supply capacity. And there's a long list of um, structural policies that um, I talked about with Michael before. So. We're not out of options, and monetary policy is not our only option. I think it would be a mistake to rely solely on monetary policy here. Um, question over here. Hello. Uh, Alex Lekovic from CQ Capital. Um, is the movement from 5 to 5.2 per cent seasonally adjusted unemployment a trend? And um, is it possible that the next movement is still up? Uh, is the movement from 5 to 5? No, I don't think that's a trend. Um, the, it's interesting because over most of last year the participation rate was, uh, was holding steady. It had risen quite a lot and then it had uh, held steady. But in the last few months 
the participation rate has started rising again. And I'm not sure why that is. Uh, employment growth has not slowed down at all. We're still adding on average this year almost 30,000 of people to, to um, the, the workforce, which is a large number of people. We don't need uh, that type of employment growth to sustain a steady unemployment rate. Uh, but the participation rate rising means that the unemployment rate is lifted, even though employment growth is still strong. So in and of itself, I don't think it's a concerning trend. Um, are there any media questions from the floor? No, no, there aren't media questions. OK. They're in, so, they're in the dark. They're in the dark. <laughs> that could be it. A question from the back. Yeah, thanks, Michael. So, I don't think it has any uh, direct implications for monetary policy at all. Uh, it would be complementary to a monetary easing if that's what takes place. Uh, what, removing the uh, floor serviceability requirement that APRA has had will allow some people to borrow more. But only a relatively small share of the population borrow the maximum amount that banks offer them, and I think that's good. The data that we have says maybe somewhere between 10 and 15% of people when borrow the very maximum the bank will allow them. Uh, when they go to the bank, if APRA uh, does in fact remove this floor, some people will be able to borrow more and some will take advantage of that and that will help. But that's not a substitute for lower interest rates because lower interest rates work through the exchange rate and they affect the, the uh, cash flow of every single person who has a borrowing at the moment. So it's complementary, but uh, it's not a substitute. That was really interesting. You said that uh, lower interest rates work through the exchange rate. Yeah. That's how it's supposed to work, and um, that's okay. what actually, that's how it works. Uh, just a question over there at the back. We have a... Sorry, just like, quickly on that same uh, topic as well. So we've had that announcement from APRA. The federal government's also making it easier for first home buyers to get a deposit even though they don't have enough money. Is that compatible with more responsible lending? Uh, well, it's up to, up to the bank to implement that responsibly, isn't it? And so, uh, I, th I think it certainly can be. I don't see it as being inconsistent, but, you know, the banks still need to uh, make their decisions, paying due regard to the responsible lending laws. Yeah, Mark Ludlow from the Financial Review. The Morrison government has just announced that it's not going, it's going to delay the introduction of its first round of tax cuts for low and middle income income earners. There was some suggestion it was going to happen this financial year. It now looks like it's going to be delayed till next financial year. Does that change the RBA's outlook on anything? Uh, well, it would change the, the graph that I showed there on the forecast for household income growth incorporated the passing of the uh, the budget measures on for the tax offsets. So you need to remember that the current offset in legislation, I think, is $530, uh, and the budget included another $580 for some um, people. So we we had included that in our forecast that I showed you there on the basis that there was bipartisan support for that policy. Uh, the Prime Minister's comments this morning suggest that there wouldn't be time for the Parliament to reconfigure and pass that. If that does not occur and there's not some other way of getting that money to households, then household income growth will be maybe 0.3% lower over the course of this calendar year than I showed you in that graph. Um, and that's moving in the wrong direction. So I think it would, it would be good if there were a way um, for the households to get the, those tax offsets, but the timing may mean that that's very difficult and it may have to wait till next year. Okay. We have a, another question over there. And uh, that will have to be the last question of this, uh, of this session. So please, what was your question? Uh, Lucky last from Bloomberg. Uh, Governor, I'm just wondering about the timing um, when you're talking about considering a rate cut in two weeks' time. What's changed between now and two weeks ago when a lot of economists following the inflation and the weakness that they saw in the economy were expecting the central bank to go in May? Um, was it just an opportunity to then communicate through a speech? Was it to wait for perhaps a bit of an unruly election to get out the way, or, or has something else changed? Now, the election had no role at all in our um, monetary policy uh, decisions. We, re we really focus on what we think is the right decision, and we implement that regardless of the political um, situation. Uh, what's changed uh, 
No, there's, no, there's no kind of dramatic change, but over time, really over the course of this year, we've been gradually and progressively reassessing what level of unemployment is compatible with the inflation target. And as, things have, as the evidence has accumulated, it seems to me more likely that that number is below 5%. And the data that we've had since the last board meeting are consistent with that and reconfirmed um, this, this uh, sense that, that uh, wage growth at the current rate of unemployment isn't really picking up substantially. I mean, wage growth is still running a bit less than 2.5%. And we, as I said in my remarks, in New South Wales, where the unemployment rate recently has been down low fours, wage growth is only 2.5%. So the evidence keeps on accumulating that we can sustain a lower rate of unemployment and not have inflation a concern. And the, the recent labour market indicators have softened a little, so I don't think we're going to make progress on unemployment over this year. It's probably going to be steady at best case. And we actually can and should have a lower unemployment rate. And right. monetary policy can play a role. So it's, it's a progressive kind of reassessment, and then the data is reinforcing that reassessment and the labour market data in the last two weeks suggests we can have lower unemployment. And at some point, um, either monetary policy or some other policy can help us get there. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. The Governor and I will now return to our seats, and uh, John Clifford, the Managing Director of Morgan's, will come up and provide a, uh, promote a, a vote of thanks.